Tēra koto te whānau o Auckland Unitarians. Tēra koto nā māna hiri. Nō mai, haere mai, haere mai ki tēnei pāre karakia. A te atua, tēra koto, tēra tato katoa. <laughs> we welcome you into the space made sacred by Auckland Unitarians for 118 years. We know you come here for different reasons, to find community, to seek your spiritual and personal truths, to question, to nurture your heart and soul, to be nurtured, to explore new ideas, to find comfort, and perhaps to find the answers to some of your bigger questions. We know you come from different places, different religions, different beliefs, and different backgrounds. We hope you'll find connection, comfort, challenge, and love here. We hope you will find ways to provide outreach to others in our congregation, in our local community, and in our world community. After the service, we hope you will join us for morning tea. It's our sacrament of hospitality, and it won't be complete without you. For my opening words, I offer two quotes. The first is by Rosa Parks. Racism is still with us, but it is up to us to prepare our children for what they have to meet, and hopefully we shall overcome. And the second is by Martin Luther King, Jr. I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of race, racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word. We light this chalice to find the inner peace love for each other, and faith in ourselves. Also to be welcoming to whomever we meet and kind to all living creatures. So gather around this light of hope as we share this time together. When I was coming up for sermon topics for May, I don't know what possessed me to choose today's topic. But I'm it's a challenge, so let's see how I get through it. The answer to whether or not racism is curable is maybe. Scientists are working on it, but they aren't there yet. But they do know a few prerequisites. Racism is what Roger Kipling coined as the white man's burden, not just for Trump supporters and people who dress up in bed sheets, but all white people, even for Unitarians and their predominantly white faith movement with their first three principles, which are actually an antidote to racism. If you're white, you are subject to white consciousness. What Unitarian Charles Alexander describes as moderate white supremacy. Moderate white supremacy is systemic, invasive, and self-perpetuating. Continually prioritizing white cultural, cultural values and interests above those of marginalized people of color. It permeates and corrupts our practices, systems, and institutions, even corrupting the reforms we institute to bring about equality. As a black man, Alexander points out that it is the white people's burden 
to cure themselves. The, the cure begins with understanding the source and dynamics of racism. See, racism is layered. At the bottom is internalized racism. Even good white people have race-based beliefs and feelings. These feelings are inculcated in us from birth by the biases in our families, classmates, our white culture, including the pervasive effect of the media. It is important to note that no one is born racist. To become racist, we have to be carefully taught. The more racist attitudes are normalized in society, the more they blind white people to their own attitudes and their impact on people of color. The next layer, interpersonal racism, is more blatant. This is bigotry and biases shown between individuals through word and deed. Those who express hatred to people of color give moderate white supremacists cover. We can point our finger at them as bad white people and deny our own racial beliefs and attitudes, which gives support to a more, even more insidious form of racism, institutional racism. Institutional racism involves discriminatory policies and practices within organizations and institutions. Here's one example of institutional racism from our own Unitarian history. It is the story of the Reverend W.H.G. Carter, a big man with a big personality, light skinned, six feet two, a man of charm, energy, imagination, and learning. He trained as a minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, but never served as a minister in that denomination. He disagreed with many beliefs of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, starting with the divinity of Jesus. As an adult, Reverend Carter worked as a photographer, a mural painter, a teacher, a postal worker, a funhouse operator, and a real estate speculator. Like his maternal grandfather, William Henry Gray, a freeborn African American, Carter was a political activist. He sold a tip sheet to house rate, horse race gamblers kept a roulette wheel in his church to make the point that gambling in and of itself was not sinful, and operated a friendly neighborhood pool hall, no swearing aloud. <laughs> Reverend Carter moved with his wife and 15 children to Cincinnati in 1918. That same year, he founded a Unitarian church in Cincinnati called the Church of the Unitarian Brotherhood. It was probably the only African-American Unitarian church in America at that time. Along with overseeing the work of the Unitarian church he founded in Cincinnati's West End, he ran four times as a Republican candidate for the city council. Being Republican was different then. Although he never won, he founded a fraternal order called the Grand Order of Denizens, whose initials spelled God, and was a dedicated provider of food, money, clothing, and advocacy to poor blacks in Cincinnati. At the time, other Unitarians knew about the church and its founder, but turned their backs because the church was African American and poor. 20 years later, a representative of the American Unitarian Association came to investigate, but the conclusion of the official report was, I do not recommend Unitarian Fellowship for Mr. Carter or subsidy for his movement. In other words, there, were no, there was no ministerial degree for Reverend Carter and no money for his church. Shortly afterwards, the Church of the Unitarian Brotherhood closed down. The last layer of racism is systemic racism. 
the ongoing racial inequalities maintained by society. It puts people of color at a permanent disadvantage in all aspects of life. They are going to lower decile schools, more likely to be incarcerated, have difficulty getting loads, suffer higher unemployment, and when employed, they are in lower paid jobs, live in unhealthier homes and more dangerous neighborhoods, and have higher infant mortality and lower lifespans. This form of racism, supported by the three other layers, is by far the most destructive and prevalent. In New Zealand, it falls most heavily on Maori and Pacific Islanders. It is maintained by those of us who are white, either by our blindness to it or by the privilege it confers upon us. This includes social justice-oriented Unitarians. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to share a shameful story that has been buried in the annals of New Zealand history. It is the story of eugenics. Eugenics is a belief that the genetic composition of the human race can be improved by selective breeding. It judges certain genetic groups as inferior while promoting other genetic groups to be superior. It is a movement that began in England. Its, its stated purpose was to protect the purity of the white race. It spread to Europe, America, Canada, and eventually to New Zealand. Sir Truby King, founder of the Plunkett Society and a member of the Dunedin Eugenics Society, was a strong proponent, along with Unitarian Sir Robert Stout, a former premier and chief justice. Eugenics was the founding purpose of the Plunkett Society. King wrote the Plunkett Society was founded to improve the caliber of Caucasian New Zealand babies by a strict regime of scheduled feeding, exposure to sunlight, and cleaning. The destiny of the race is in the hands of its mothers, he said. In a submission to Parliament, prominent New Zealand eugenicists argued, quote, it has rightly been decided that this should be not only a white man's country, but as completely British as possible. We ought to make every effort to keep the stock sturdy and strong, as well as racially pure. The pioneers were, for the most part, and I an ideal stock for a new offshoot of the mother country. The Great War revealed that from their loins have sprung some of the finest men the world has ever seen, not only in physical strength, but in character and spirit. It also revealed that an inferior strain had crept in and that New Zealand was already getting its share of weaklings. Surely our aim should be to prevent as far as possible the multiplication of the latter type. Overseas eugenics principles were adopted to terrible ends. The theories took their most horrifying manifestation under Nazi Germany, where up to 400,000 Germans were forcibly sterilized and 70,000 degenerates euthanized. But even as the full extent of Nazis' racial cleansing programs were be I'm sorry, but even as the full extent of, extent of Nazis' racial cleansing programs were being discovered, the idea of ridding the race of the mentally ill or feeble-minded was still doing the rounds in New Zealand. The horrors of the Holocaust essentially marked the end of eugenics movement in New Zealand although vestiges of it remain, especially in some Pakeha attitudes towards Maori and Pacific Islanders as inferior races and social polities that put them at a disadvantage. An example is how racism undermines Maori self-image. Studies have shown that it's not uncommon for Maori 
to buy into racist stereotypes. In one focus group, a Maori man said, if they're going to keep writing bad things about us, then we are going to be bad because we feel like we are meant to be bad. Maori are meant to be in jail anyway. Statements like this break my heart and motivate me to unburden myself of racial attitudes that cripple a Maori child's chance to have the same chances in my life, the same chances in life my white race has given me. If we are to find a cure for racism, it is going to have to begin with examining our internalized racism. We need to understand that our internalized racism is a spiritual crime against ourselves that burdens and blinds us. It turns out racism is a choice. And empathy goes a long way towards curing it. The more we put ourselves in the other person's shoes, scientific studies show the less racist we become. So be it. Well, last week we had a discussion and it went on and on, but <laughs> I thought maybe this week we probably should talk about it a little again. So, have you ever thought of yourself as a moderate white supremacist? You have? <laughs> no. But I didn't notice racism around me <clears throat> until um, when I was 17, I was working in a minimum wage job, and then I heard about this job in Tauranga as a toll operator. It may surprise you, but I doubled my wages. Back then, you got time and a quarter, time and a half, double time, triple time, on different times of the day and the weekend. Anyway, 80% of the toll operators were Maori women. And I could hear, you know, you've got 30 people there and you'd notice that the Maori women were amazing. Their warmth and their lovely way of speaking to people, it was just noticeable. And then one day, the management said, right, from now on, anyone who wants to be a toll operator has to have school C. School C back then was a qualification that you had to pass when you were 15 or 16. So with a wipe of a pen, these white management um, stopped Maori from getting these well-paid jobs. Just a quick add on to that. Um, as I came through into the workforce, same thing with those old qualifications. The next one up was university interest, known as UE, which you did when you were around about sort of 17, perhaps. Um, so you had to complete four years of high school to get to that, and you couldn't get a job at a government department doing anything unless you had UE. Hi. Um, a lot of, of views and whatnot seem to be intergener... or seem to have started in, in the earlier generations as well. The things that got handed down to me as a kid... Um, from mainly my mum, not so much my dad, but mainly my mum, and, that, and it was shocking, absolutely, actually. And um, I think these days, you know, if mum was still alive, well, she moderated as she got older. But and I've spoken to other friends, and it's been much the same. The the, the generation before us seemed to be extremely racist. Um, I don't think they thought they were, but they 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 were. And I think, thankfully, now these generations are actually saying, hey, this is no good. And the next generation is, again, saying it even more. You can't say that. That's, that's no good. You can't say that. Um, the other thing I'd just like to say quickly is that from our short time at Glenn Taylor's school, the two role model assemblies we've been to with Duffy Books is, um, have all been... Um, 
well, both of them have been Pacific Island or Maori people who have done well and one of them was asked why she got into that job and she said because there's too many negative views that are put forward in the media and I want to make a different, I want to put different, I want to put forward positive views and that's why this lady got into television. So yes, it is something and it's been recognised and and I hats off to those role, Duffy role model assemblies. I'm Gary and I can recall when I was a student um, working on the wharves, um, we, we often did that um, in weekends and evenings to make money. Um, and I recall at one smoko time sitting down on the edge of the wharf with a Maori uh, guy that's the same age as me. And he was acting what I realised now, he was paired what I realised now is quite depressed. And he told me he hated being Maori. Um, and he talked about a lot of disadvantages and I couldn't convince him otherwise. I said, no. Um, you, the opportunity's there, you just got to grab it with both hands. But he would have none of it. He was thoroughly depressed about being Māori. And that's stuck with me all these years now. Um, I just thought that the point that um, Clay made about a person's perceptions being coloured by their own um, perception of themselves really struck home to me. And that... Um, just brought back to me this week, I was working with a little boy of five who um, I've spent quite a bit of time with him. He's a very bolshy kid and um, he's always in trouble. And um, he's, he's Murray Pacific child. He's a, a beautiful child. He's a very task-oriented child. He has so much potential. He leads the others in the playground, not always doing the things that they should be doing and not always uh, socially conscious of what he should be doing. Anyway, Wednesday morning he spent about half an hour with me and we had a really great time and I said to him, wow, you are just so onto it, man. He slaughtered me at the games we were playing. I mean, he was just so strategically minded and bright and um, I said to him, oh, you know, you can take two stickers, take one for you and one for your friend. And so he spent a lot of time picking out what he was going to give to his friend. And then at morning tea time, I just, um, just after morning tea, I'd collected another child. And there he was sitting outside the principal's office. And I thought, oh, and he looked so down. And um, anyway, I found out that he had been writing um, F-U-C-K on the wall outside the school. Well, actually outside the classroom, and that was basically the last straw. They had decided that would be it. He was out of zone, so he wouldn't... It just really ripped my heart because there's so much that this child is battling. And when we had the Afi meeting later, the comment was, his mother says to those children, you are stupid children. You are not intelligent children. You do not know what you're doing. Why do you do these stupid things? Why are you so, just like your dad? Why are you, you know? And these kinds of things are going on all the time in our community. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a real battle. This may seem very strange, but I was actually, when we arrived in New Zealand in 1953, we, had, we were registered aliens. We had to carry an alien's registration certificate because we are not of British stock. That's what the law said. The Aliens Registration Act specifically said those are coming immigrants of non of non British stock had to be registered aliens. I think things have changed since then. We, I was an eight year old boy coming from the Netherlands. <laughs> so I'm from Cincinnati, where are you? Um, mentioned that story and I had never heard that so that really hit home for me first of all and my dad is a minister at the UU church there um, but I would just like to say going off of what they said in the back um, I think that as the generations um, progress it has been um, becoming more of an issue in the forefront racism and also just like sexism transgender phobia and everything else like it's becoming more present especially in the United States where I'm from 
And, but I think that there is still that underlying like, upbringing and teaching and it's like taught to us from the beginning even if we don't want to. My parents from when I was young have tried to um, avoid it and not let it come onto me but I went to one of the um, most integrated schools, high schools in Cincinnati so there were a lot of different people, people of different races around and even still like in high school there were um, lots of examples of it and bullying and things like that and so it's it's not going to go away just by you know an older generation dying off and the younger being slightly more progressive like it has to come from the ground up i think to follow on to that it does take i think a lot of self introspection um because we are we we are part of a society and we see these things in in the media and in the news and it, it's around, all around us and um, I had a conversation just last, this last week with um, one of my neighbors um, she's the mother to one of my one, one of my daughter's friends um, very nice very lovely woman um, but we were talking about uh, where my older daughter was going to go to intermediate next year she's um, we're in zone for Remware intermediate and I'm happy with that and and then this other lady just she's like oh but I was talking to somebody and she's like none of the kids from Wormera actually go there it's all these kids from Papa Toy Toy and I'm just looking at her and I'm thinking in my mind well what's wrong with the kids from Papa Toy Toy maybe I should have just said that <laughs> but I was a little thrown <laughs> but and, and the it's these and I mean this is a very nice woman she would never think of herself as racist. I think if I had told her, has called her out on it, she would have been horrified. But unless we look at ourselves and the beliefs we've been not even not necessarily raised with in our fa personal families, but that surround us, it's very hard to see. I want to tell you a story as, as a final bit um, in my research for this. I read a long uh, article about Sarah Selwyn, wife of George Augustus Selwyn, the first bishop, Anglican bishop of New Zealand. And it was fascinating because part of what happened was George Selwyn, uh, it was a time in England of ideal humanitarianism. And he came here with the idea of, of being a better Briton, okay? That, that some of the attitudes that existed in England we, we'd somehow get rid of. And one of the key things for him was to build a, a positive relationship with the indigenous people of New Zealand. And he had a great fondness for Maori people, learning the, to rail on the way over on the, sh on the ship. Uh, he uh, built great relationships with them. Uh, he included them as equals as he built up the church. Uh, when he created St. John's Seminary, uh, Maori were as equally welcome as anyone else. And, uh, and it was all going along perfectly well. And then the settlers started showing up. And the settlers came and eventually outnumbered the Maori. And suddenly it was OK to change the land rules and take away the land. And when there was any objection from Maori over their sacred lands being taken, then they were called rebels and traitors. Uh, and uh, that was the beginning of the land wars. And it was all those Maori's fault. <laughs> and sadly, you know, racism even changed George. And he became a chaplain to the British Army. Uh, he, he still ministered to Mari, 
and still had an affection for them. But he lost all credibility with the Maori in New Zealand. And from that time uh, was the downfall of Maori self-image. Because up t until that time, as the treaty required, they were equals. They were equals. So one of the ways we could fight this is to learn about the treaty. The one in Maori, not the one in English. And to uh, find ways to keep confronting our society to meet the requirements of the treaty uh, as we try to combat racism. I didn't mean to start a new discussion. <laughs> I did behind you. Um, what you said, Clay, about um, Selwyn, um, I can repeat that story from a Methodist point of view. I wrote um, a history of the Takapuna Methodist Church, uh, a centennial history in, eight, in 1983, and the first great shock I found in writing this um, was that they had got the year wrong by 20 years. And the reason was that they didn't count the um, um, mission to Maori, which had been going in Takapuna 20 years before that. And, and they had the same fate, that once the wars over land started, the, um, the Methodist missionaries uh, objected. Basically, if you were a Maori, it was OK. But if you were a Maori standing up for your land, you were not OK. And um, it was very heavily into that story. In uh, LA, there's a museum called the Museum of Tolerance. And I don't know if anybody's been there, but I highly recommend that you go. It's an interactive museum. And uh, it was set up. There's a section originally about Nazi Germany. And it also has other sections. But when you enter, there's a woman or a man who uh, gives you an introduction. And then you go through. You pick a door to go through, and one says, um, you know, I have no prejudice. And the other says, I have prejudice. And of course, people, you know, go to the one, I have no prejudice. And it's locked, because we all have prejudice. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> I don't think I can taunt that, but I grew up as a Lutheran, and my father was an elder in the church. And I was a freshman, and I was shocked twice on one Sunday. The pastor of the church wanted to raise a million dollars to redo the church, and I was a freshman at university. And I was sitting next to my father, and my father apparently had enough of this. And he stood up, and he said, I don't think we should take the money for our church. We should invest it in ghetto churches. Well, they picked me up off the floor because my father was very conservative. <laughs> the next thing they picked me up the floor was all of the people in the church says, no, we don't want to give them any money. And that changed the relationship that my father had with that church. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and stories. For my closing words, blessed is the path on which you travel. Blessed is the body that carries you upon it. Blessed is your heart that has heard the call. Blessed is your mind that discerns the way. Blessed is the gift that you will receive by going. Truly blessed is the gift that you will become on the journey. May you go forth in peace. Thank you.